uh, sermon today. Uh, as you, as many of you know, probably all of you know at this point, uh, several weeks ago we had a vote uh, to call a new head pastor, and we unanimous, unanimously called Pastor Drew Williams, uh, currently serving in Southern California, uh, moving out here to the Midwest with his family. And uh, we're very, very excited to welcome Pastor Drew. I'm sure that many of you from the letter that you got uh, knew that you could go on and watch sermons of his. I'm sure that many of you have watched sermons of his. You've seen his face. You've kind of got to know him a little bit, maybe read his blog. Uh, but over the past several weeks, Pastor Drew has been meeting with the staff and him and I have been meeting uh, multiple times to just kind of discuss the church and what's going on here to get him onboarded as quickly as possible uh, so that when he gets here, uh, which the projected date for his start is October 2nd, so you can kind of just remember that, that we're talking right at the beginning of October, that when he gets here, we can really hit the ground running with ministry. And I'm very, very excited uh, to bring him in, and I'm very, very excited to introduce him all to you, uh, someone to me who has become a friend now. Uh, so I'm very excited for you to meet him. And uh, in order to help with that introduction, um, Pastor Drew has actually sent us a video to help us get to know him a little bit better. Hello, New Life. This is Pastor Drew, and my family and I are so excited to come join you soon. We love getting to know new people, and we hope to share meals with many of you in the coming months. So I thought I'd give you a head start on getting to know my family. This is my family, my wonderful wife, Megan, and my two wonderful kids. We are very, very excited to welcome Pastor Drew into our family and to have him meet all of you and get to know all of you. As you can tell, he is passionate and fun-loving, and it will be a great addition to our team. And I'm very, very excited to see uh, what God is going to do as he continues to do uh, what he's been doing so far under uh, Pastor Drew's leadership. So here in a few weeks, we'll get to welcome him uh, there at the beginning of October. So I'm sure that there'll be opportunities for you to hear more about him and prepare for that as we go along in September uh, but for now, we're just so excited to welcome him. So, well, let's jump into our passage uh, today. We are continuing our sermon series in Colossians, and uh, we've spent several weeks now walking through the book of Colossians, and I told you that I had kind of two reasons I wanted to walk through Colossians. One was to teach the book, because Colossians is an amazing little letter that Paul wrote that I think just helps communicate the gospel in a very clear and concise way. But also, I wanted to equip you all with some tools on how to read the scriptures. Now, as we've gone along, we kind of talked through how to read the scriptures, and we've talked about looking at the major parts of the scriptures. We've talked about maybe highlighting certain key phrases and key words. I've really pushed repeat, repetitively reading or listening to the book over and over again, and that's a really important tool 
to get to know the scriptures. So it doesn't mean you have to read it, but you can also listen to it. That's actually my favorite way uh, to have uh, to engage in scripture and to hear scripture is through my ears. So I like to uh, listen to audio Bibles and listen to passages again and again by way of hearing because these books are actually meant to be heard. They were written with the intention of being read out loud. So if you don't like to read, that's okay. It's actually probably a benefit to listen to it, maybe even more than we sit down with our book and look at it because it's meant to be in our ears as we hear it and think about it and process it. So we've, we've kind of walked through some main things, uh, some big ways that we can kind of break up the scripture and kind of understand it. And we've all been answering this first question when it comes to reading the Bible. The first question that we need to ask when we sit down and open up our Bibles and begin to read a passage is, what does this passage say? That's the first question. What does this passage say? It means just looking at the plain meaning, the plain reading of it, what does this passage say? If it's a story about Jesus healing somebody, we go, okay, well, this story tells, or this is a story that tells how Jesus healed this person in this town, right? That is what the passage actually says, all right? As we walk through this passage today, we're going to ask that question, what does this passage say? And that's why we do some of the highlighting and some of the breaking up to understand just what's being said. What is the scripture saying? The second question which is the harder question, is what is God saying to me in this passage? That's when we get into what we call interpretation. We interpret the passage. Because remember our first ground rules is that God speaks to us and he reveals about himself. He reveals about how he wants to save us. He reveals how to live a godly life in the scriptures. But they're also bound into certain time and place, and we have to respect them enough to kind of get into the world of the Bible instead of demanding that it, you know, is like for us. We have to get into the world of the Bible to understand all the ins and outs of what it's saying, and from what it's saying, then we can understand, okay, what is God telling me now? So we first have to understand what it says, and then we can understand what God is saying. So as we've gone through Colossians 3, the beginning of Colossians 3 is this great shift where Paul begins talking about the life of the believers. He talks about how to live life. It's very, it becomes very practical. Take off all these old practices, put on these new practices. And this is what Pastor Bill talked about last week. And now we're getting into this section of scripture where Paul begins to talk about the church, the family, and the world. Okay, he talks about the church in these first couple verses. I think it's 16 and 17. And then verses 18 through like the end of chapter three, he talks about, or the beginning of chapter four, he talks about the family. And then he talks about the world. Okay, it's really, really practical. These first two verses are about the church. And he says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. Okay, let the word of Christ, that is the scriptures, dwell in us richly. And in fact, just a little side note, the book of Ephesians has a phrase almost exactly like this, but it says the Holy Spirit instead of the word of Christ. Paul wrote both Ephesians and Colossians, so we can probably understand that those things are interchangeable. So the Holy Spirit preaches the word to us and speaks the word to us and enlightens the word of Christ to us. So let the word of Christ or the Holy Spirit dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, okay? So that means teach the Bible to each other, teach the scriptures to each other, teach each other about God's work. And with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. That sounds a lot like what we're doing right here, doesn't it? We get together, we hear the word, our liturgy, especially in this traditional service, is just full of scripture. It's just quotes of scripture pulled out and then just put together in a way that sets up worship for us. We sing hymns and we sing songs to one another to uplift and encourage us with joy and with thankfulness in our hearts. This is what we're doing here. We are obeying the word by doing what we're doing right now. This is a way that we let the word of Christ dwell richly within us, is by teaching and admonishing and singing songs with one another. That's what this passage is saying. Gather together, hear the word, and sing songs. Okay, easy. That first question, easy. What does this passage say? We got it. He continues on. And whatever you do in word or deed, 
Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All right, so what is this passage saying? Pretty self-explanatory. There's no like secret answer here. It's pretty self-explanatory. This is a command from Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he tells us, whatever we do in word or deed, to do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God our Father through him. So we have this gathering that we get together. We teach each other the word. We sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. And then this should change how we go about everything, how we talk to people, how we live our lives. Everything should be changed because of what happens here. Because we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, Therefore, whatever we do in word or deed, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is this passage saying? Just that. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Right? That's like a kind of a simple step. And these letters that Paul writes, they're really nice because they're very familiar to us. Usually we can just work through, walk through it, and it sounds very normal. And we're like, great, this is fantastic. I know exactly what this passage is saying. There doesn't seem to be anything hidden or secret here. There's nothing confusing. Sometimes when we read through the Gospels and Jesus makes some statement, we're like, what in the world is he even talking about, right? It's hard for us to understand some things, but the nice thing about these letters is that they're very simple. Gather together, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach each other, sing songs, and let it affect your everyday life. Do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God through it all. That's what this passage is saying. These first two verses are are for the church, how we exist in the church. This is the place where we get together, hear the word, sing songs, and are changed, transformed. And then we walk out of this place and into the world, and what we do and say is in the name of the Lord, and we give thanks through it all. The second question is the harder question. What is God trying to teach me personally, through this passage. What is God saying to me in this passage? So now we know this first question, and now we have to explore the second question. And as we head into this kind of personalizing the scripture to understand what it's saying to us, we have to answer the first question first, because that second question can never contradict the first. Whatever God is telling us personally from this passage, it has to be in line with what the passage says, what the passage is trying to teach us. It has to be in line with that. We have to let the word itself guide us as we think through what is God teaching me personally. Now, there's a little tool here. This isn't the only way to do this. This is one of the ways that I like to do it. There's a little tool that you can use and it's called the law and the gospel. We know that, there, that God speaks to us in a couple of ways. He gives us commands, and he gives us promises. The law is the command, and the gospel is the promise. Now, as we read through this passage, and we think, okay, teach and admonish one another, got it. That's a command, but hey, you know what? I think that we can do that. We can gather together, and we can teach each other. We can sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Yeah, I think that we can do that. All right, that's the law, that's the command, we got it. Then we get to this point, and it says, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Think, okay, that's a command. That's a little bit harder though, isn't it? Whatever, like everything that I do, Every word that I say, every action that I take, every thought that I have, I have to do that in the name of the Lord? Well, that's a harder command. And we run into this issue here that I talked about a couple weeks ago. And it's this, that the commands of God are not, cannot transform us. They can't change us from the inside out. We can follow some of them, And by the Holy Spirit, we can actually follow most, if not all of them, but they cannot transform us. And that's what we talked about back in chapter two, when Paul talks about all these laws, all these festivals and feasts and dietary laws, the law, the commands cannot transform us, and that's by design. There's only one thing that can transform us, and that's the promise of God. 
That's the promise of God that we are his children plucked up from the dominion of darkness and placed now in this new kingdom. That he has by grace saved us and brought us into his family. So when we read this passage, there are some times that God talks to us in law and sometimes that God talks to us in gospel and we can apply both to our lives. This is a good way to ask the question, what is God teaching me? So here, God is teaching us to gather together, to teach each other, to sing songs, and to walk in a manner worthy of all these things, to do whatever we do and say in the name of the Lord. But then we run into the problem of we don't always do that, do we? We don't always get that right. In fact, we're quite quick to say, ah, you know, not sure I'm feeling super great. Maybe I won't go to church. Ah, uh, I don't know. I'm pretty busy this week. Maybe I won't go to Bible study. Ah, man, today I'm really, really swamped. Maybe I won't read my scriptures or listen to them. We're actually pretty quick to give up on these things, these commands. And so the gospel has to be introduced somewhere. We have to kind of understand that God is also giving us a promise here. I think the promise is right in this last little phrase, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. All throughout Colossians, we've had this back and forth. Paul will give some commands or he'll give some instructions or some wisdom, and then he'll quickly talk about the work of Jesus. And then he'll give some commands and some instructions, and he'll talk about the work of Jesus. And it's as if Paul wants us to anchor our lives around the work of God and Jesus Christ. It always comes back to what Jesus has done for us. And that's what we give thanks to God for, for the work of Jesus in our lives. We give thanks to God because of what he has done for us. Gratitude and thanksgiving is a response. Necessarily, it's a response to something. It's a response to being given something or to be experiencing something. We go outside, maybe we go on a walk or a hike, and we think, wow, it's beautiful out here. This trail, this park, this neighborhood, man, it's beautiful. If it evokes gratitude in us, it's a response to something that has happened to us, something that we experience, and ultimately something that's been given to us by God. And all throughout these three areas, the church, our home, and the world, thanksgiving keeps coming up. It's the theme through it all. Paul sees the life of the believer lived out in response to what Jesus has done for us. Jesus has done all the work. He has plucked us out of the dominion of darkness, placed us in the kingdom of his beloved son, and our response ought to be gratitude, thanksgiving. And as we seek gratitude and we seek thanksgiving in our life, as we look for it and approach it, it actually produces good things in us. It produces maturity in us. That's one of the reasons Paul wrote this letter, is that the readers and hearers can be mature. And the mature believer, maturity for the Christian, always ends in love. That's the mark of maturity, is love. And it all comes from this place of gratitude, thankfulness. Because you know what? You can't be bitter and grateful at the same time. Like you can't be resentful and grateful at the same time. You can't be angry and grateful at the same time. You can't think that you're self-righteous and be grateful at the same time. Those things can't coexist. And so if we're grateful for God and what he has done for us, it actually uproots a lot of the unholiness in us. It uproots a lot of the selfishness and resentment. And when we allow gratitude to be the main way that we go about our existence, it changes the way that we interact with the world around us. And we can look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, and we can say, you know what? When you have gratitude, you can have a lot of those things. Because being grateful and thankful for what you have, it makes you a lot more patient and peaceful when you don't get your way. 
because gratitude and impatience cannot coexist. Gratitude and bitterness cannot coexist. So Paul here, he's emphasizing thanksgiving through this passage because it is a response to what God has done. And this goes all the way back to the beginning of chapter three, as you guys heard last week, set your mind on things above. Focus on the work of Jesus Christ and gratitude is cultivated in your heart. When you focus on the things around you, when you focus on the culture or politics or things that you don't like happening, then it actually produces the opposite of the fruit of the spirit. Impatience, resentment, anger, bitterness. When you focus on these things, it produces these kind of earthly things, these earthly feelings, these earthly emotions, and not gratitude, and certainly not the fruit of the Spirit. And so this is the gospel here, is that Jesus has done a great thing for us, and we can be grateful and thankful for it. And when we focus on that, everything else just kind of falls in line. So I want to emphasize that again, that the maturity, I should say the mark of maturity for the believer is love. Because the whole point of the law and the gospel, the whole point of God giving us commands, us realizing we can't always meet those commands and having to rely on Jesus and hearing the gospel, hearing the promise and saying, yes, Jesus, I receive this and I respond with gratitude. Hearing the law and the gospel is for our maturity. It's for us to grow and become uh, more broad and loving and generous and good people. Living in the kingdom, it's for our good, for our maturity. And the mark of a mature believer is love. That's what maturity is in the Christian life, is love. And so as we continue on, by the way, if you wanna look at good definitions of love, the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5 that I've already referenced, and also 1 Corinthians 13, now, this is the one that you always hear at, at weddings. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude in the rest. There's a whole bunch of them. But those are really good definitions of love. If you want to look at them, if you want to know what a mature Christian looks like, read Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, and 1 Corinthians 13, the definition of love. That's when you know that uh, you can look at and reflect on your own life if you have that maturity. And so we move on through verses 18 through four, uh, chapter four, verse one. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, uh, mostly because way back, way, way back, uh, on May, I think it was May 8th, it was Mother's Day, uh, I preached about this kind of subject uh, because Ephesians and Colossians are very similar to each other. Paul probably wrote them at the same time. And so you can go back and listen to that May 8th, it's Lord of All, part two, where I address this very issue. So wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, obey your parents in everything. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Whatever your task, put yourselves into it as done to the Lord and not to your masters, since you know uh, that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance. This is a great passage. Again, we don't have the time to get into it. The wrongdoer will pay back. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly. Uh, just a little side note, I just want to reiterate this uh, again one more time. Uh, from, I make this, I talk about this on, in May 8th as well, uh, in Lord of All Part 2. But just because Scripture gives wisdom into a situation doesn't mean that it endorses that situation. So we hear that like phrase, like, wives, be subject to your husbands, that the husband is the head of the wife. Remember that in a patriarchal society, that's not necessarily an endorsement of it when Paul gives wisdom in it. Because as we read these passages, especially in Ephesians, we kind of see that Paul's subverting the whole thing. And he's saying, actually, if you have authority, you ought to be the one who serves the most. He turns everything upside down. You guys remember that? Because it was like the first half, all the men were like, yeah, women, you know, whatever, be subject. And then I get to the second half and the guys are like, oh no, this is not good. This did not go the way that I thought it was gonna go. So, so everything is upside down. So here in Colossians, Paul doesn't get too much, as much into it. In Ephesians, it's the main point that he's actually making everything upside down. That the husband being the head actually means that the husband serves the most. That the master being above the slave means that the master actually serves the most. And it kind of turns everything upside down. But just because Paul gives wisdom doesn't mean he's endorsing the thing. And this happens all throughout scripture. 
God will give commands or wisdom into situations. That's not an endorsement of that situation, okay? So that's why we can look at these and we can see the masters and slaves. And we think, oh man, is the Bible saying? It's not. The wisdom is not an endorsement. So that's just a little side note. All right, so we jump here to verse two of chapter four. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. So as we head into these last couple of verses of this passage, this is when he starts talking about the world. He gets to how we deal with outsiders a little bit later. Uh, but this first, he, he introduces this whole idea by uh, talking about prayer, about devoting ourselves to prayer. And prayer is just conversation with God, listening to the scriptures, responding to God by talking to him and uh, uh, kind of seeking his guidance on things. And then he says this phrase, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. That phrase, keeping alert, literally means watch attentively or to search for, to look for, describes what somebody who's keeping guard of a camp or a city does at night watching out for. And Paul here is saying that when we keep attentive to prayer, the outcome is thanksgiving. That we keep attentive in prayer with thanksgiving. And I think this is an encouragement to us to look for and to be attentive to the work of God in our lives so that we can have gratitude. And again, this just goes back to chapter three, verse one. Set your mind on things above. Look, look for reasons to be grateful. Look for reasons to be thankful for what God has done. Keep attentive to these things. And that's what we do in the church. As we gather together, we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We hear the word through the teaching. We sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs and psalms to each other. And all these things are about God's great work for us. And we look back even at the, uh, the very beginning of our service with confession and forgiveness. We start off the whole service with a proclamation of our forgiven sins. That provokes thanksgiving. And we always sing, this is the feast, which is this great celebratory Thanksgiving song. This is the feast of victory for our God. All throughout our worship service, and hopefully every time your pastor preaches, he's preaching about the work of Jesus to rescue us and to save us and to make us new. Because as we know, we go about our lives, as we apply the law to our lives, we know that we can't obey all these commands and that we need Jesus. We need his work in our lives. We get to celebrate the work that he has done for us. We get to celebrate the work that he has accomplished for us. That when we were far off, when we were hopeless, he brought us into the family of God and gave us the Holy Spirit. That we can have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and all the rest. He's accomplished that for us and given it to us. And so when we pray, our prayers ought to lead us to thanksgiving. Because ultimately, whatever situation we're facing, whatever thing we're upset about, whatever family situation's going on, the work of Jesus Christ is greater. The work of God is greater than those things. And so we pray about them, we talk to God about them, and it ought to lead us to thanksgiving because we're keeping our mind on things above, on what God has done for us. Not what the world is doing to us, not what our family is doing to us, not what our health situation is doing to us, but what Jesus has accomplished for us. And we look for reasons to be grateful. We look and keep attentive and diligently search out reasons to be grateful. Paul then gives a little aside here. At the same time, when you pray, pray for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, that we may declare the mystery of Christ for which I am in prison. So here we go. Paul's in prison while he's writing this letter. It seems interesting that he hasn't brought that up yet, but he, he brought it up here. And so he says, hey, while you're praying, also pray for us, because by the way, I'm in prison. So I could use a little bit of help here. Could use the prayers. So that I may reveal it clearly, 
as I should. Conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. He says, as you look to the outsiders, be diligent in prayer and be careful. And actually the word he says, he says wisely, conduct yourselves wisely. Don't get too bought in. Don't get too invested in whatever's going on out there. Don't get too emotionally invested in what's happening, all the drama in the world. As you deal with outsiders, deal wisely with them. Conduct yourselves well, making the most of your time. And then always be gracious. Man, this is a good word. Always be gracious, because I hate to break it to you, but sometimes we're not the most gracious people. We don't always deal graciously with those who are different from us, those who believe differently than we do. But he says, always, <laughs> let your speech always be gracious. Season with salt so you may know how to answer everybody. Again, this is through careful consideration and thought. This is through prayer and by receiving the gifts of God, by receiving the peace and the patience and the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. And so this attitude of gratefulness, this attitude of thanksgiving that Paul is really bringing out throughout this passage, I think is, is kind of the seed that produces all the fruit of the Spirit. Because we start with this reality that we receive everything from God and that we have nothing. We respond graciously and gratefully to God for his work to us. And that helps us live our lives in a way that is filled full to the brim with the Holy Spirit, filled full to the brim with the fruit of the Spirit, filled full to the brim with peace and patience and the rest. But we have to start with understanding that we look to Jesus and his work and we cultivate gratefulness in our own life because God has done a great thing for us. He has given us a great promise in Jesus Christ, eternal life as his children, life eternal full of peace and joy and patience and the rest. And this is what he gives us. And so resentment, bitterness, this can't be part of our lives. We have to develop and cultivate gratitude first. And then our speech can be gracious. We can spread the gospel and we can offer it to other people as well. Amen. This time I invite you to stand.